bless you. Uh, we'll go to that. I guess we'll go ahead here from Father according to 1 Corinthians 14 before we start. Then I'll give an introduction. Father, we thank you. We thank you that uh, we can hear from you, not just through your scriptures. And I'm reminded that that uh, in the book of Exodus it said uh, you placed inside this box, you surrounded the, you surrounded your word, and you put cherubim, and this was the speaking point, the speaking place, the debir, for Moses to go and hear from you. And your word, the written word, is what the Ark of the Covenant was around. So we thank you that, it, that is, we do not go to translations of men or new, new living translations. We want to, we want to hear. We want to go straight to the Debir. We thank you for Rotherham coming the closest we have to the Hebrew and Greek. And we thank you for, not only for you to speak through the written scriptures, but also through the Ruah Hakadesh, the Holy Ruah, the, the Holy Breath that is inside of us. We thank you for helping us uh, hear from you. If anybody would like to speak in tongues and interpret or prophesy, please do. I will prophesy. Do not hide the fire that kindleth inside of you. Do not put it under a lampshade. Do not hide it away from the rest of you, of what you are and what you present yourself to be. Let that fire roar within you like a mighty blazing forest. Let it shine out and glow. Speaking tongues of Turpic, Quiliana, Eata, Satamea, Tumoson, Oku, Yesetekea, Time, Eana, Eatu, Seteke, Bekea, Tumoson, Aleana, Eatu, Quiti, Abiata. Rejoice again, I say, rejoice. You are my sons and my daughters, and whom I have blessed with great spiritual ability, great power, and great efficacy, that you may shine your light to the world, that they see that I abide within you, my son abides within you. And then we walk hand in hand, distributing my truths, which will set the captives free. Once again, once again, I, I am calling you. I'm calling you with my arms wide open. Step forward. Be not afraid. Know that anything that I've made available for you to do, I've also made you competent to accomplish it. There is nothing that you can't do if you lean on me and walk on my word. I have given you, I have given you the promise, yea, I have told you before, and I tell you again, you are my children in whom I am well pleased. Amen. Amen. <coughs> the name of the line of prophecy too is tonight what I wanted to share on is uh, <coughs> Lessons from Shemot. Shemot. So anybody know what the first book of the, the yeah. is called? It's not Genesis. It's, it's called Barashit. Barashit. Okay. In the beginning. Okay. Exodus. Anybody know the name? Uh, no, I got it right down. These are the names. Is, is the beginning. And so, uh, but it's it's the names. And so, but it's something like Shemot. And Moses is Moshe. So just a couple of lessons that uh, um, from. Shemat and, and Moshe at the beginning of the Exodus. But it's neat with, with it, uh, as I'm on my another adventure, cover to cover, reading Yahweh's. If we do what he says, tells us to do, he reveals things to us. Yeah. And he goes, from cover to cover, I want to take notes. No, no notes. Oh, man, because if I take a note, I go off on a tangent. Cover to cover, I'm getting all this information. I did not know that the speaking point was his word because the, what. What made the box so important, the Ark of the Covenant? The covenant inside. And that's where Moses went to hear the speaking point. It's like, this is the closest we have the Ark of the Covenant. That's why most Christians today would not be impressed with the Ark of the Covenant. We want to see a box. <coughs> the box wasn't important. It was what was inside the box. It was Yahweh's word. You guys don't want Yahweh's word. So, But uh, I digress. But Melania's prophecy went on about the... Uh, uh, well, what I gleaned from it was shining a light. And it also said in Exodus that the, the word, Moshe is told, or Moses is told, it, the word will shine light. I didn't know that. He's learning things. It's going to shine light on Israel. And, and how often, if we know the scriptures, uh, light will make manifest darkness. Some, some people will attack us, name call, whatever. Get out of here. Get out of here. Turn that light off. It makes me think of people in a strip joint. Yeah. Or, or in a, and you turn on all the lights. Ah! Holy cow, turn that light off. But the whole thing is we are to manifest the light. And, 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 and one of the purposes of it is just to give people a choice. 
but the teaching um, was a, a, it shouldn't be a long one. But well, one of the, 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 the neat things is a, a short take was what very unusual thing in the book of Exodus where the magicians are apparently allowed, it didn't say that, they are allowed to mimic some of the plagues. Not all the plagues, but some of them. Where in the word has Yahweh's mighty works ever been mimicked like that? I don't know. I mean, I haven't done the research, but I don't ever remember him calling fire down out of heaven for Elijah and then, then they call fire. No, no, no. I don't remember the, the, the sea being split, then they split. No, no. So there's something very unusual. And Yahweh will give us hints to some of these things, but it would appear, and I'll, and I'll, go, and I'll kind of validate things, it would appear that uh, if we go to, and we'll go through these scriptures too together, but Matthew 8, 31, we get to see a glimpse where the, there's a demonized man who has thousands of demons in him that, that refer to himself as legion. And they, they say, permit us. Don't kick, at first, don't throw us into the abyss. What's that all about? Okay. The second is, let us go into the swine. They ask for permission to do something. And what I believe, it doesn't say this, but I, what I believe is a hypothesis, is that Yahweh allowed these magicians to do this. Why? To harden Pharaoh's heart. Because I'll show you the scripture. If, once they mimic the blood, Pharaoh's heart got hardened. What, what's the purpose of all that? Which brings to the, the bigger teaching tonight was there were nine plagues. And, and the wrath of Aaron will say when Aaron threw down his, Moses throws down his staff, it turns into a snake. Aharon throws down his, it turns into what Rothan will say, a sea serpent. It's the same word as crocodile. So it could have been a crocodile because later on it's translated crocodile. You can imagine throwing a crocodile before Pharaoh. It's a whole other story. Okay. And then there's... There's how many plagues? Nine. Ten plagues. Oh, come on. It's going to be ten or twelve. You said nine a minute ago. Did I say nine plagues? Yeah. Okay. You uh, said nine. Yeah. Uh, um, we'll go to this. But what, what's the point of all this? Yeah. Just wipe them out. Do like what you did to the Syrians. Get rid of these guys. Yeah. And the point is that, well, I'm going to show you a scripture. Yahweh gives an explanation after the seventh plague. And thank you for correcting me with, with that. But with the seventh plague. Yahweh is going to say, you know the reason why he's doing all these plagues? And doing it so methodically? Because if you're reading poor Moshe, Moses is going, holy moly, it's getting worse. It's getting worse. It's getting worse. Sounds like the United States. Yeah. Oh, my God, not again. Oh, it's getting worse, worse, worse. Um, what's the point of all this? And here's Moses being tried. And, and I, I'm not going to come to a conclusion as to the point, but one of the points is, <clears throat> Yahweh will tell us, and we'll go through the scriptures. He says, the point of all this is so everybody knows me. And as I read that, I went. And then I reread it the next day when I had some extra time after I was done with my reading. And I went, how many times as believers, all of us, have been waiting on something? Or you're running a race. And you're burning out. I'm, I'm burning out here. you got to give me something. And I, and I think about Aharon and, and Moshe uh, the, and other Israelites going, come on, man. you got to give us something. And the air with that thinking, which I had never considered until this week, the air with that thinking is you're just thinking about your problem. You're not thinking, what does Yahweh want? Yeah. The severity of your necessity should not stop you to go, what does Yahweh want out of this? Mm -hmm. And what he's going to say in the seventh plague is, don't you see us? Help us, help us. Anybody think about me up here? And what, and what, what does Yahweh want? We're going, to, we're going to read about it. We're going to read later on that Yahweh, even with the plagues and stuff, he is sifting and purifying people, giving them chances after chances after yeah. chances, because everybody's going to hear about Yahweh for hundreds of years what he did to Egypt. It was a mighty masterpiece. So, but first, we'll go go to the water, uh, the blood turning into, excuse me, the river turning into blood. It's Exodus chapter seven. And the neat thing about this is reading. Um, And I'm um, reading this, uh, okay, this is before the blood. 
Are you talking about Je Genesis? Exodus chapter no, 7. Exodus yeah, 7, 14. We're going to go 7, verse 3 and 4. <clears throat> So actually, if somebody would read 2 and 3, please. Chapter 7, verse 2 and 3. Thou shalt speak all, all that which I may command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, and he shall let the sons of Israel go out of his land. But I will suffer Pharaoh to harden his heart, so will I multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. Okay, so will I. So, because you keep reading this, and Pharaoh's heart's getting harder and harder. And, yeah. and I, I remember reading this the first couple of times I started reading, and go, why are you hardening his heart? It looks like he's tricking Pharaoh. Yeah. Just, hey, get this thing over with. But you can see right the second half of that, so shall I multiply my wonders. Now, now we're going to go over. So what does that mean? I'm not going to come to a conclusion. This is just a speculation. What's going on with that? First... You got the crocodiles or the sea serpents. You read right, we won't go into it. In chapter 9, verse 10. And the, and the magicians, Pharaoh's magicians, were able to mimic this. What's that all about? Holy moly. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, but then uh, chapter 22. If somebody, uh, we'll actually read 21. Uh, Talking about verse? Verse? So yeah, verse 20 okay. through 22. Somebody read that. Chapter 9? Chap no. The same chapter. Oh, yeah, he said chapter I did. Verse 9. Okay. Verse 20 through 22. And Moses and Aharon did so as Yahweh commanded, and he lifted high the staff and smote the waters that were in the river before the eyes of Pharaoh, before the eyes of his servants, and all the waters which were in the river were turned to blood. And the fish that were in the river died, and the river became loathsome, so that the Egyptians could not drink water out of the river. And thus came it to pass that blood was in all the land of Egypt. Keep reading. Yep. And the sacred scribes of Egypt did in like manner with their secret arts so that the heart of Pharaoh's wax bold, and he hearkened not unto them as spake Yahweh. So we can see right there that one of the results of the mimic, I'm just going to call it a mimic, <clears throat> was what happened to his heart. And Yahweh said he was going to wax his heart bold. Why? Back over verse, I think it's chapter verse three. But I will suffer Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh to harden his heart. Why? So I will multiply my signs. Pharaoh is absolutely evil, but Yahweh is going to use him how to amplify who he is, and and, and for for what reasons? Many reasons, but one of the reasons is he's advertising TikTok. You want to know who I am? You want to know who the Creator is? And uh, but so so but the, so one of the, the the purposes, or I guess where I was going with that, is the mimic. It, it could be that somehow in the supernatural realm, Yahweh was allowing the magicians to do something that they couldn't normally do. Because then when you, you go over to uh, chapter eight on your right hand side of the page and you go to verse eighteen when he does the gnats. Verse chapter eight, verse eighteen, and the sacred scribes didn't like manner with their secret arts to bring forth the gnats, but they could not. So you can imagine, here's the magicians, and as far as we know, nobody's ever mimicked anything like that with Yahweh. This is, I don't know of anywhere in the whole book. Can you imagine them being emboldened? Power? Can you imagine, yeah, the, the, we will see that in similar things in the book of Revelation. So there's something happened there too, but something's very unusual here. But we'll keep our finger here and turn to Matthew chapter eight. That's page eight. Uh, in the Greek covenant, the Greek. And in verse uh, 31, so this is the, the legion of demons that are in the man of Gadarin, Gadarin, they're going to talk to Yehoshua asking permission to do something, authority. And the demons began to beseech him, saying, If thou cast us out, send us away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Withdraw. 
So okay, it's allowed. So here, here's some here, here's a, an example of Yahweh's son allowing uh, authority. So so that is one thing I never even considered that possibly that Yahweh was actually allowing some of this to happen. Why? To wax and bold. Now, then what's the point of, of Pharaoh getting hard, getting hard and hard and hard? We'll go there in chapter seven. But what's really neat about this is if you read this in chapter seven, verse one, Yahweh tells Moses, "Go to Pharaoh." And as far as I know, that's like show up to the White House. Why the heck would Pharaoh see Moses anyways? I don't know. <laughs> You'd think he'd kill him. Pharaoh's a wicked dude, right? So he goes, go to Pharaoh. He goes to Pharaoh. And then there's the crocodiles or the serpents, but it could be crocodile fight, big thing. And then Yahweh goes, he's going to the supermarket. He'll be there in 45 minutes. I want you to meet him at the entrance. So Yahweh says he's going to the river or the water. And what does Yahweh do? Why is Pharaoh going to go to the water? Water is life. You go, go camping without water. You have to have water. Did you know what the fall of Rome was? How they overtook it? It, it was the aqueducts. So once, once they got rid of the aqueducts, you can't have a metropolis. You can't have the water. But here is, Pharaoh's going to go to the water. And, and, oh, no, it's that guy again. What's his name? I hate this guy. Hey, good job with the crocodiles, by the way. Next time, we'll get him around, too, with the crocodiles. You can imagine the magicians. This guy, and what is he going to do? He's going to kill the river. Think about it. The river is life. They worship the flooding of the Nile, and the fish in the Nile is going to feed them. Remember later on, they're going to be complaining, oh, the fish and the cucumbers that we had. And what's Aharon going to do? He's going to, and I never thought about this, but when, but when Aaron's going to stretch forth his hand over the waters, it's going to all die right in front of him. And the fish died. Can you see how bad Egypt stunk? With, with tons of dead f frogs. You know what dead frogs would smell like? You can imagine. Dead fish everywhere. Do you know what blood smells like? And so here, he, but Aharon kills, the, kills it, and then, then it would appear that somehow Yahweh possibly allowed them to produce blood. Uh, also, to mimic it. And that was John Ching. goes, we don't want more blood. Get rid of the blood. Yeah. But they can mimic it, which would be, get them a little bit more cocky. They do have power. But it's not power against Yahweh. They're mimicking something. But then when they go to the, the gnats, uh, the gnats, uh, the, we read that in verse 18. They go to mimic this one and they can't. What chapter? Chapter 8, verse 18. So it was the, you see the third plague right above verse 16. And the sacred scribes did in like manner with their secret arts to bring forth the gnats, but they could not. So there came to be gnats among men and among beasts. Then said the sacred scribes unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of Elohim. And so you can, you can imagine if, if what I'm suggesting was true, and it's just a suggestion, can you imagine uh, the adversaries of the body of Christ starting doing mighty works? Do you think that would embolden them? Yeah. Absolutely. Would they get cocky? They are cocky. It would it make it more cocky? Absolutely. And you can imagine if you're Israel going, this doesn't look good. They're getting really powerful over here, possibly. Uh, but then when it gets right here, we can't do this. You can imagine, but what, what does Pharaoh do? His heart. But what's the point of all of this is if we go to chapter 9, verse 13. And if somebody would read 13 through 16, please. Then said Yahweh unto Moses, Rise out early in the morning, and station thyself before Pharaoh. Then shall thou say unto him, Thus saith Yahweh, Elohim of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For this saying am I sending all my plagues unto, the, unto thy heart, and amongst thy servants, and amongst thy people, to the intent thou mayest get to know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now... My, I have been put forth my hand and spent me and my people with pestilence. Now she has have secretly disappeared. From so the we're going to pause, just pause right there. He's going, I could have done this. Yeah. And it could have been like Thanatos on the Marvel comics. They're all gone. Yeah. Could Yahweh have done that? Absolutely. Yeah. He did it with the Assyrians. Gone. But he didn't. Why? Okay. Disappear from the earth. Uh, but in very day for this purpose have I let thee remain for the for the purpose of showing thee my might and that my name may be celebrated in all the earth. And so as I read that, 
I, I put a note down. I said, don't let your need cause you to lose spiritual focus. Israel had a need of deliverance, but what did Yahweh have? Do you have a need? Yeah. Advertisement. He wanted a chance to show his might. That, and I'm not going to say why, but I'm going to say some of the fruit of Yahweh showing his might is we'll, re, we'll, we'll go later on. We're going to talk about Rahab and the Philistines still know about hundreds of years later of the God Yahweh. Yeah. Who is his Elohim? And we get to, this is the seventh plague. How many are there? There's ten plagues, right? Mm -hmm. Who here is St. Charlton Heston's in the Ten Commandments? I Okay. What is the pinnacle in, the, in, that, in that movie? The greatest mighty work? The splitting of the Red Sea. He hadn't even gotten started by the seventh yeah. play. <laughs> Moses was like, hey, just get this thing over with. Come on, man. I got some this is I'm getting I'm getting gray hair here. Well, Moses, you shouldn't get gray hair. You should have faith. Oh. Now I'm not gonna say Moses is getting gray hair. I probably would. Uh, but the whole thing is what's the purpose of such a long process? Get this thing over with. Stop your reasoning. When you are in fellowship. I gotta say now this process, whether it's being married, whether it's children, whether it's jobs, whatever you're waiting and waiting and waiting on, um, the first thing is this concept that I'm suggesting only works if there's no leaven in your life. If you have sin in your life, then you might be the problem. You have to get rid of your sin. And if you have unbelief in your problem, this un unbelief. I was praying with Rachel last night, and the words came out of my mouth. Unbelief lengthens things. We know about that, don't we? What did he tell Israel for 40 years? You and your unbelief. Look what you just did. Okay, but faith can speed things up. It, it accelerate things. So get rid of, is there sin in your life or something? Get rid of the leaven. And the best thing about, about leaven, getting rid of the leaven, I got to read a book. It was, it was a Hebrew book trying to explain uh, uh the, the Feast of Weeks and getting rid of leaven. When I am getting ready, if it's a big investment and I have a lot of money on the line, first of all, I know that I have errors and typos. Now, I like to convince myself it's all good. Then I upload it into a thing. It turns it into a PDF. And I, I used to just kind of like, I don't see any problems. Rejected. <laughs> now, what I have learned through humility is find the mistakes they're in there it's there there's there's mistake in there and then if it comes down and i find oh, i got one instead of going oh no 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 find see if you there's see if there's three or four that and reward myself for finding the mistakes it's a different way of looking for mistakes yeah it's in there and then if it's not in there congratulations but that's the way to do it that's what we should be doing for leaven in our life sin there's some what is sin dad's last teaching missing the mark it's, it's not necessarily malice if you're missing your mark of course we can get back and go back and remove some of these things but back to Yahweh's um, and, it, it, and we won't go into this uh, we'll turn a page which because we'll go over the Passover lamb and all these very unusual things uh, but the but the pinnacle is like Moses had no idea what was happening. And it says nobody was as patient as Moses. Let us be patient. And when your timeline's not lining up and you're burning out a little bit, remember, Yahweh knows the future. <laughs> is he going to reward you? Yeah, he doesn't want any of his servants to burn out. He'll reward you. Well, then why is he doing this way? He knows the future. What do you know? I know the books of the Bible. <laughs> How's your track record? Well, if I compare it to your son, not too good. But if I compare it to... Okay, okay. Then just have faith in the author of your life, okay? But what's neat is, is uh, then you go to the, 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 the ten plagues. All these things are going to happen. Uh, but uh, turn to chapter 15. I'm just going to kind of go off on a short tangent. Another neat lesson from the book of Shemot the names chapter 15 and this is after the songs think about this guys 
it, it put yourself in Moses' position. If you've never read this, read through Exodus 3 through the 15th chapter. It should take you an evening. And put yourself in Moses. Would you be burning out? They're go it looks like Israel's going to stone them. The Egyptians are going to kill them. But what's going to slowly and slowly what happens is this is not even a dog would move its tongue against Moses at the end. And everybody's like, don't say anything about Moses. But I, I, before we go there, look right above chapter 15. What does that say? Israel's song of triumph. What was the response of Moses after this? Ver chapter 15 verse 1. Then sang Moses. I wonder how many of us in here, if, if we, Galatians 6, 9 says, you shall reap if you faint not. Can't be a wimp. Are you a sissy? Call me a sissy. Then get up! You think Moses felt like quitting? you kidding me? Can you put yourself in Moses' position? No. Moses' response was he sang to Yahweh a song. And what's wonderful right after that, who else is going to sing after Moses? And uh, in, uh, chapter 18, verse 20, then Miriam. And as I read this, these are all new things that, that were just revealed to me as I was spending time in this speaking place with Yahweh. Chapter 20, then took Miriam, the prophetess, sister of Aharon, the timbrel, in her hand. And what did she do? And the women do? Do you know, does this remind you of anything when the women sang? How about after David got done with the war? David has killed, Saul has killed his thousands, and David is ten thousands. And I've read uh, other places where people are trying to explain that the women would sing songs. And then actually after, after, you, after you lost battles, that the women would maybe shake their heads and mock you or whatever. Because uh, later on, Yahweh will talk about the woman won't wag her head. Uh, but after this war, what, is, what does Miriam do? They break out into songs. What, what was the purpose of all these of all these plagues? Yahweh to show his might. Can you imagine the, the, the manifestation? Dropping down to your knees, singing a song. Wow! Why? What had just happened? And I'd never seen this before. Look at verse 12. Did somebody read that? What's that, 18, 12? 15, 12. Now did stretch forth thy right hand, earth swallowed them up. What swallowed them? Earth. The earth. Wait a minute, the Red Sea swallowed them. But it says right there, the earth. Does that remind you of another instance? Yeah. Numbers chapter 16, verse 32. Yeah. The sons of Coral getting haughty. And Yahweh, could he have snapped his fingers, mm -hmm. disintegrated and turned them to dust? Yeah. What are we going to do? The mouth is going to eat them. Oh, it could have been, it could have been just, or it could have been, whatever is going to get people's attention to go. That would get your attention. Anybody else? The earth just swallowed them, and in numbers it says she swallowed her mouth. And here, what happened to Pharaoh? Swallowed. And they're looking, going to go, wow. And the guy? purpose of this, Yahweh's might. Could it be in some of our lives that some of the things, the long things, that uncertainties, what's going to happen after your ministry, you don't know? Some of these other things, is it going to be worth it? Is it going to sustain spouses, children, whatever the things are? Is it going to be worth it? Could it be that Yahweh is working something mighty that nobody gets any glory out of this? Me! Just me! Well, what is one of the results of Yahweh doing it, the ten plagues like this? Turn to the 18th chapter. Not that far away. I also didn't know Jethro had another name. Did you know Jethro had a different name? No. I also, uh, yeah, so there's a different name of Jethro in chapter. But somebody read 18 verse 1. Jethro, priest of Midian, father-in-law of Mo Moshe, heard what? all... He what? He heard. he heard. Where was he? He was in Midian. He was in Midian. He was not in Egypt. <laughs> what happened? Hey, Moses, Moshe, hey. I just heard some crazy stuff about you killing. Can you imagine the, the what exaggerations or whatever would happen between Egypt and people seeing these things? And it goes to Jethro, and Jethro goes, 
Who's the guy? <laughs> what did he look like? What do they call him? I know this guy. Yes, and he goes, and what happened? Jethro comes and he hears. And the neat thing is Jethro gets to hear, and Jethro gives his father like his good counsel so Moses doesn't burn out. Uh, but Jethro, what he heard. Who else heard? His wife. <laughs> Who else heard? And you're going to go, a lot of people heard. People getting a chance. Here's Yahweh's heart towards his creation going, come on, guys. Everybody's getting a chance. I'm going to make it easy for you. I'm going to get some really good, <laughs> a nuclear bomb's going to go off. Um, turn to Joshua chapter 2, verse 9. That's page 236. How many years were they wandering in the desert? 30. Okay. And 2 verse 9, if somebody would read that. Have I not commanded thee, be firm and bold. And 2 be... verse 9. Oh, 2? Yeah. Yeah, we got one down here. We're going to see chapter 2. I found it. <clears throat> and said unto the men, I know that Yahweh hath given unto you the land, and that the terror of you hath fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away from before you. There's 40 years. 40 years. What's the number 40 significant of? Probation. Probation. Hey, everybody in Canaan. 40 years to think about what happened to Egypt. And... I was I was got to witness a guy right on the street and his his neat because he was he was a marine and he said he goes he's he goes I'm convinced that people convince themselves that there is no evil he goes I've seen evil I I've seen the insurgents I got to see some Islamic guys that it was scary 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 and uh, and, and so the thing is here is it, who in Canaan is going to fight against this Elohim. What does Rahab say? Everybody's heard. How many choose? Her and her house. Yeah. I wonder if her house had seven other people. I wonder if it was eight people like Noah. It doesn't say. But here's Yahweh for 40 years showing his mighty work for all these people. And the Gibeonites going to know too. Then later on in Gibeon, they're going to go, okay, enough, enough, okay. We've heard about this 40 years, 40 years, and then... The, the last example we'll look at is at 1 Samuel chapter 4, 292. So you get to see some of it. Samuel was a bad dude, man. You get to read what Samuel was able to do against the Philistines. Um... But uh, we're going to read verse 8, what the Philistines are going to say about Yahweh. And so we read 8 and 9. Woe to us, <clears throat> who shall rescue us out of the hand of, of these majestic gods? These are the gods who smoke each other with <coughs> all manner of smiting in the desert. Take courage and quit yourself like men, ye Philistines, lest you come into bondage to the Hebrews as they have been in bondage unto you. Therefore, must you... Quit yourself like men and fight. So they chose to fight. Could they have become? Did you know some Philistines did become Israelites? Uriah was a Hittite. There are people that converted. There were some people. And so one of the ten plagues of, of this exhausting, methodical thing that was Yahweh was reaching out, was advertising, and he showed himself mighty. And, and I, I was thinking about that even with the plagues, what's the point of another plague and another and another? And all of a sudden, here comes Pharaoh. Then, I, then I'm just thinking... Well, the Red Sea is like the, the pinnacle. Here's Moses, the Red Sea. Oh, here's all the rest of this. Yeah, oh, this is going to be perfect. And then he swallows them up. Turn to Isaiah 55. We'll, we'll finish there. But I would like to encourage us, when we're thinking about long processes or how is this going to work out, you know, Moses didn't know who was going to take over after him. Yahweh never told him. Hey, I've been doing this for 40 years. Can you at least tell me who's going to pick up the scepter? Moses, worry not for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall worry for itself. It was neat. I was, got, I was, I was praying for somebody this morning. I, I got to give him a prophecy. <coughs> Wonderful thing. It, it says, don't worry about tomorrow. Are you supposed to plan for tomorrow? Yeah. But once you start worrying, 
you start missing a mark. No, no, no. You, you could be thinking, thinking, and thinking. And, and there was even a time Moses brought it up to Yahweh again. He goes, don't bring it up again. And he'll do that with you and I. And if we bring it up again, now you're irritating him. <laughs> but you could say, the, 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 the future, the, the ministry, the rest of these things, Moses didn't know. But Yahweh's got it. Yahweh's the future of the ministry. Yahweh's the future of Moses. And, um, but uh, Isaiah 55, 9. Can somebody read that for me? For higher are the heavens than the earth, so higher are my ways and your ways, and my thoughts and your thoughts. <clears throat> and then we'll read 10. For as the rain and the snow descends from the heavens, and thither do not return, except they have watered the earth, and caused it to bring forth and bud, and given seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void but shall accomplish that which I please and, pro and shall prosper in the whereunto I have sent it. It could be, you know, Yahweh is, is the creator of all things, and it could be that you've been given a task and I've been given a, a task to work a mighty, wonderful Ten Commandments movie for others, all others to see. But if you quit, he'll find somebody else. He gives you opportunities. And if we blow it, we can apologize and say, do it again. Send me again, please. And he's gracious and, he, and he's patient if we're humble. <clears throat> but it could be the best part of your whole life is, be, is because the adversity you're going through is going to be like a Ten Commandments. Father, we thank you for these words. <clears throat> we thank you for encouraging us and for helping us. And we thank you for correcting us and sharpening us so that we can be your and your son's image. We thank you for us not to be cowards when it comes to your word, but to shine your light. And if people reject you, then they've rejected us. Let us not compromise. And let us conform and be what you need us to be in every manner, whether that's washing feet, whether that's listening, whether it's giving hugs, whether it's calling lightning down. And uh, I'm going to give a word of prophecy, but before I go prophecy, I want to share something that I had. There was a lightning storm recently, a beautiful summer lightning storm. I come home from after my fellowship with my mother and my father, and I get home, I get a word of knowledge, you go on a walk. I'm like, I'm out of time, go on a walk. So I go on a walk by myself to go over by this little bitty bridge where I can maybe see some animals. And as I'm standing there, I look, and there's lightning. <laughs> And off that distance, so you don't even get to hear it. And you can feel the wind. And I'm looking at it. And this was the communication he gave me. Aaron, do you believe greater power is in you than in that storm? And when these words came, actually the words were... The words were that actually came to me was, Greater power is in me than in, in that storm. I can't take credit for it. I wasn't thinking that, but and I had to sit there and think. I, I saw there was there's a movie about God's creations. There's explaining things, and they said, they said I haven't validated that in some of these summer electrical storms, there's more energy than in nuclear bombs. You think about what lightning does when it hits something. Think of the winds of tornadoes and hurricanes just blowing things out. I, I, I thought about in the book of Job, the whole thing just whack whacking it out. Do you believe greater power is in you? And I, I sat there and I marveled. I need to start thinking that. Yeah. That lightning, power, thundering, whatever it is. And, and, and as I thought about that, uh, the next thing that happened in my heart was, if we've been delivered that kind of power, we're going to be great. What did you do with it? Yeah. Did you walk in power? Did you cut, and it could have been, it could be caught, it could be blind eyes or whatever it is, but greater power than those things. So Father, we thank you. Greater works are available to us because your son is seated at your right hand. Amen. Amen. Thank All you. Right.